Good morning. Good to see you guys today. Uh, one of the things I have been doing a lot lately is looking at pictures of when me, Rebecca, and especially the kids were younger. Man, it's a fun thing to go back, isn't it? Just to remember and reminisce some fun and uh, precious times. And, you know, it's even better to do with my family just to be like, oh, remember this time and uh, just kind of go through. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, fine, then I'll do it with you since you spurred me on. Let me just kind of go through a couple pictures real quick. Humor me. So this is my girls. You guys ever been to Avery's? Like they loved touring that place and getting the sodas. Like it's the same soda, but whenever they put a label on it that says like booger juice or something, it's just like even better. So, all right, next one. Um, parades, how many parades kind of all sat through and gone through? This one's uh, right there in downtown West Hartford. So just some fun memories. Let's go to the next one. Oh, Lily. Lily, when she was little, she would eat so much, and she'd put the muffins it, like a chipmunk in her cheeks, and they would just puff up. It's like that would kind of remind us of that. We got another one. Oh, um, Ava. She loved me. She was like my little buddy. And by the way, this one's proof that I did once have a full head of black hair. Um, <laughs> I, there's debate. Well, what did this to me? Is it the kids? Is it pastoring a church? So when I'm with you, I blame the kids. When I'm with the kids, I blame you. But uh, nonetheless, um, next one. Um, that's Emily uh, when she was a baby. So she moved uh, here with us, which is a good thing, when she was one year old when we started this church. And that picture was taken, I believe it was at A.C. Peterson's, like right after we held our first service in the basement of the Elmwood community. Obviously, she was exhausted from like all the setup and everything else like that. So she needed a milkshake to cool down. But, th but those were some great times. And, you know, it never uh, fails that when I look back, I just always smile, just think thinking of all the wonderful times, and I'm filled with a great sense of gratitude for everything that we were able to experience, a sense of joy, but also sadness, because those days are gone, and everything has changed. But what I have to remember is that new things are still happening, things that are also being captured by photo and video and in our minds now, and someday we'll look back with great fondness, because guess what? The kids... They're growing up. They are changing. And that's just the thing. I don't want to forget that there are great things that we're part of um, in the journey, you know, that, that brought us to where we are now. But I don't want to be so focused looking back at the past that I forget and miss all that is around me right now. I don't want to ex miss the experiences that God has for me, the new thing that he is doing, again, by looking back and not being focused right now. And so that's what we're going to talk about in today's message, which is entitled A New Thing. And um, this is part of a series called On My Heart, where I've been talking about things that as a pastor are on my heart. And today's message is going to be probably um, a more personal one. And it's also going to be one that has been uh, that I'm passionate about because it has been in the making for a long time, certainly over the past few months, honestly, over the last few years and probably over the last 18 years. What's crazy to think is that um, in a month, this church is going to be 18 years old. Isn't that crazy? It's like we're going to be an adult really soon. So um, you know, for whatever that's worth, that, that's going to happen. Um, but here's what I want to say. Um, this, if you're a first-time guest, then the beginning of what I'm going to share with you is going to be very helpful for you today, uh, for everybody, and the rest of it may be weird for you. I mean, that's just what it is. But come back next week, and it'll be fairly normal. Uh, but for those of you that have been around for a while, that have been deeply invested in this church, then as this is on my heart, then this will be on your heart too. And so I'm just going to kind of share some things with you, and then talk about how I hope we process these things together. But let's go ahead and get to today's passage. If you have your Bibles, Isaiah 43. Isaiah was a prophet that uh, ministered to the nation of Israel that God called to, and he spoke a lot of prophetic words in foretelling, telling, but he also foretold and told about a lot of things. But he shares these verses. I've taught them before, but um, there's a lot in here that's very applicable to us today. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea a path through the mighty waters who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, 
I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And once again, Isaiah, as he speaks these words to a very specific context, to a very specific people, what we have to remember is that these words were captured and recorded by God's Spirit and preserved in Scripture, so they are very applicable and valuable to all of God's people today, including the church, this New Testament group of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation that God ministers to and God ministers through. Now, normally, I would spend the rest of the message kind of unpacking some key thoughts to help us understand and apply this, but what I'm going to do today is I'm going to kind of go quickly through some of those points and then spend the rest of the time applying that to a very specific application. Once again, things will get back to normal next week. Uh, But here's the first thing that I want us to remember, and if you're taking notes, is this. Remember what God has done. Just like there is great value in me going back and looking at times with family and experiences and memories, there is great value in you going back and me going back and remembering all the experiences with God. And Isaiah, in fact, references an event that he wants them to remember when God intervened on their behalf in a mighty way. Interestingly, it says, this is what the Lord says. And we'll get to what he says, but before he gets to what God says, he describes a couple verses uh, about what God has done. In fact, previous to what we read, he describes God as a redeemer. And we see that play out in what he said. He says, listen, you were on the run from the Egyptian army. You were hemmed in at every side. There was the Red Sea behind you, the soldiers charging at you. There was absolutely no way out. There was no hope. There was no options. And yet, God intervened on your behalf. He parted the Red Seas so you, his people, could miraculously move through to the other side. And when those fierce army soldiers, chariots came charging in after you, the ones that terrified you, he released the waters, they came in and drowned out all the opposition. And in that moment, God extinguished the threat against his people. When there was no way, God made a way. That's just what he does. And so people of God, it's important to remember that this applies to you too. You might be in a situation right now where you feel like your back is up against the wall, where you've run out of options, you see no way out, and there may be no way out, but God specializes in things like this. He makes a way. And maybe what you need to do is remember what God has done Look back to a past event when there was no way out and yet God moved in your life in a very specific way and did something, he did something impossible. And when you remember what God has done, that can inspire you and spur you on to move forward, trusting that he will help you and you can be encouraged today. Now, Isaiah reminds us to remember what God has done, but he says, Be careful, don't spend too much time there because the flip side, and this is our our next thought to write down, is don't dwell on the past. He says look back and extract all the value you can and just grab that for all it's worth, but don't stay there with those memories in hand, just kind of focused on that. Grab them and turn and face your present circumstances. God says forget The past. Forget the former things and don't dwell on the past. Now clearly, he's not saying wipe these from your memory banks because he just instructed them to remember. He's saying don't live there. Don't dwell on the past. For some of you, that's the message you need to hear today. One of the reasons you're so discouraged, depressed, upset is because of something good in the past that you no longer have. Or something bad that happened in the past that still has you. And you're you're dwelling on these things and focused on these things. But God says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. That word forget means like an intentional neglect. In other words, you need to shift your focus onto other things. Um, 
few weeks ago, I referenced, but I'm going to reference it again, John Eldridge's new book, Resilient. I can't recommend it high enough. It's very timely for coming out of the season we've been through the past few years. Uh, by the way, 180 life groups are coming up over the summer. One of you should uh, say, I'll be a leader and lead us through this book, Resilient. It's great. But he says this in the book. He says, all change initially feels like loss. But he later adds, you can't go back, especially at a time when God is moving things forward. He wants us to come along with him. And the reason that it's important we don't dwell on the past is because this helps us with the next thing that Isaiah is trying to get across. And this is the third thing to write down if you're taking notes, is try to see what God is doing now. It's important to remember that God is always at work. Even in the darkness, he is moving. He is doing something. And our problem is, is because when we look at our circumstances, we get discouraged because we don't have all the facts. We don't know what God is up to behind the scenes. And we're definitely not going to see what God is up to if we're kind of turned around and looking at the past or even if we're currently focused on our present circumstances. But all we're focused on is the difficulty, the pain, the challenge, the frustration, again, of these current circumstances. So here from the mouth of God is some great news. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Listen, whatever is going on in this world, and I know it's a lot, whatever's going on in your world, and I'm sure it's a lot, God is making a way. He's working. He's building. Now know this, it's probably not on your timeline. Here's the other funny thing about God. He's probably not going to do it the way you would have done it the way that you prayed and prescribed for him to do it. But ultimately, it's almost certainly better than if he had done it our way, and it's probably way better than we could ever imagine. God says, see. In other words, try to get it. He asks the question, do you not perceive? Now, implicit in this question is an invitation that God is working in his mysterious ways, but he's inviting you to try to discern what he's up to and what he's doing. Or at the very least, as you are trying to figure that out, to remember the past to give you enough courage and trust in God so that you can look ahead to trust that he's working, he's building now, even if you don't know exactly what he is. He's making a way. So Isaiah uh, conveys the words of God. Try to lean in and get in on this new thing. Now, some of you have been around for a while. You may remember I taught this passage a couple of years ago um, with a similar title. It was called A New Way. And when we did, we dropped some big news. And yes, in part two, I'm going to do um, the same. And so I'll just tell you, that my time as lead pastor of this church is coming to a close um, this year. In December, our governing board got together and we had an honest conversation. And they commended me for leading well over the past few years in very difficult times and challenging circumstances. Um, But... For the sake of this church to fully flourish and for my family to fully flourish, they suggested that it's time to really press in and let a new leader take the church um, to the next level. Someone that could be here fully present all the time as I once used to be, available and accessible. And so that I can be freed up to whatever God has for me in the next area, in the next season, to this place that God moved me and my family to almost two years ago. Now, I could have fought this. I could have resisted this. But the truth is, I sensed that they were right. And so while I was filled with incredible sadness, I also have an incredible sense of peace. And I want you to know there's no heroes. There's no villains in the story. God is just doing a new thing. 
So what I want to talk to you about, keeping everything in mind that we just said, is I just want to walk you through uh, a little bit of some of my thoughts about this, what's happening next, because there are good things happening for this church, and how I hope all of you will process it. And, you know, I, I've shared with you, I've just tried to be open about what's one of the things, is just, I just talk about what's going on in my life, but I, I've shared some of the challenges of leading through COVID and 2020 and all of those things. I talked about um, the aftermath of that. I talked about my wife's personal health crisis and how that pushed us to move to Florida and some of the challenging things about living in two places. But there are, you know, I didn't share with you all of the personal wrestling and turmoil. And look, I understand what some of you might think, like, wow, it, it, it must be nice. Like, you get to fly in for a few days and teach and hang out and then get to basically, you know, jet set around back to Florida and sunshine and beaches and um, avoiding winter. And I get it. But I, I just want to tell you, it hasn't really been easy and uh, that's one of the things the people around me were concerned. I've been working almost every week, about six days a week, and really doing my level best and uh, just trying to do everything for my family and the church. And I, and I think I've been faithful in all of this, but I realize I just can't do everything. Like, for example, for the church, I missed things I never would have missed in the past. Baptisms, Christmas Eve services, I never would have missed those. And in my family, I've missed things I never would have been in the past. Being there for um, prom photos, college visits, sports games, birthdays. And, and in this process of kind of trying to live in two worlds, I always feel like I'm letting someone down. Not for lack of trying. And so almost two years ago when we moved to Florida, I feel like I was an asset because I feel like it would have been too much for the founding pastor to leave right after COVID and kind of when most of us were still meeting online and very few people were back in person. It would have been too much back then. But now I believe I'm an asset in the sense that I love you, I care about it, I'm passionate about the success and health and strength of this church, but I also feel like I'm a liability in the sense that I just can't be here on the ground consistently. And, and you know when this was really drilled home to me is I spent 10 days here between like the Palm Sunday and Easter area just being here. And it was amazing getting to live back on the ground. And I got a taste of something, a life that I no longer can experience. But just being around, being amongst everybody, being able to show up at a bunch of different things, and then being in the office, working with the staff, being able to talk through different issues, kind of on-the-spot coaching, mentoring, and then just the ability to say, hey, let's go grab some lunch and hang out together and deepen those relationships. And it, it just realized that the church needs more than I'm able to give in this present situation. And listen, all I ever wanted to do is pastor this church for at least the next 15 years. I always thought that this would be what I do until I retire. However, we make our plans, but the Lord directs our steps. So here's What's happening? I want to kind of give you all of this together. And I told you today is going to be sort of an interesting day. But um, let's talk about what's ahead and what we see ahead. We have retained a national search firm um, who specializes in helping find the very best person for the position. Our representative is fantastic. He has visited here. He has spent hours with me talking about the ideal candidate. And he's working hard for us. We actually have several incredible candidates that we're talking to, really quality people. The search has been private up until now because we didn't want you to find out without hearing it from me. Um, so tomorrow we go public and we'll probably have quite a few more candidates coming in. Now the board, including myself, has been interviewing people and um, vetting this and taking this process very seriously. I want you to know that. Um, we're also talking to staff and elders and getting inputs along the way there. And here's, what, here's my belief. That as we say God is working even when we don't see it, I believe he's already picked out the person for the role. Our job is to try to discern and find out who it is and, and, and who that person is that we should call. Now, it's almost certain, by the way, that before we extend this invitation to someone, that this person will come out here and share a message on a Sunday, um, right? No pressure, by the way. Just talk to a few hundred people uh, for your job interview. Um, but 
but seriously, you should be able to meet this person before they are extended an offer. But here's what I want you to know. We aren't just looking for a good teacher, which we are. We aren't just looking for a good leader, which we are. We aren't just looking for someone with great character, which we are. We are really also looking for someone that is a great fit. What do I mean? You think about uh, an organ transplant. Like, for example, if you were to have a heart transplant, you would have to have a healthy organ, a healthy body, and the two would have to be a match. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. That's how we kind of approach these things is we need a healthy body, we need a healthy pastor coming in, and the two have to be a match spiritually, uh, geographically to understand this area, New England specifically, culturally, it must be a match. And we are very sensitive to this, and we're working with a group that understands this and has a track record in helping churches in this area. Listen, it's my belief that this is an extremely special and unique body, and you deserve a very special, call, talented pastor. And we are working hard to find that for you. Um, so... For those wondering, by the way, I do want to add this. Yes, we are still looking to hire that additional pastor, but this is now frontline. So now, I'm sure you're wondering when, and this part is the part that's a little bit uncertain. Ideally, we would like to have someone hired and installed over the summer. That gives them and their kids a chance to get into schools and so forth. However, we're not rushing this. And so my guesstimate is it'll be sometime between uh, the summer and the end of the year. Really, we just want to make sure that the process is right. And I want you to know that in the meantime, I'm not going anywhere. Um, the, when we had this conversation, I've known since December and January that this was coming. And um, I, I haven't told you until now because I was asked not to share this um, until now. But I also went back recently and said, look, I, I need to share this with our staff and our elders and our body because I need to trust them in the same way that I'm asking you all to trust me. So I've been able to talk um, to the staff. I've been able to talk to the elders. And I'm sure some of you, like, here's what I wish. I wish I could have sat across the dinner table or lunch or coffee with every single one of you one-on-one -on -one and had the conversation that I've had with staff and elders it's just impossible, time-wise, um, emotional bandwidth. It's just not possible. So that's why I wanted to gather everyone in one spot and be able to tell you this. And by the way, my kids just found out a couple of weeks ago. So it's been a tough thing to kind of carry internally for quite some time. But what I can tell you is this, and you can fact check me on this, is that I, even though I've known this, I have not been lame ducking it. I have not been phoning it in. I have been working hard and will continue to, not only to write quality messages, but also work with the staff and elders to work on initiatives to strengthen this church along with our 22, 2023 uh, theme of transform. And we are seeing some encouraging results across several metrics, including our youth is being shored back up. I'm encouraged to see some great things happening with our young adults. Um, we are seeing great things happening in our kids' ministry. More people are engaged through serving and giving. Lots of people are coming to Christ, so there are some really good things to celebrate. Now, I say this not to boast, but to demonstrate to you that I'm going to put everything I have into making sure that this church is successful. When, I, when we started this church in 2005, I put everything on the line and invested everything in, and I'm putting everything in in this process of transition, and I really just want to finish well. That has always been my belief in everything I did, not only start well, but finish well. And the, here's the good thing. I'm not running off to a new opportunity, so I have all the time I need to help in this season of change. You may be wondering about me personally and what I'm doing next. And the answer is, I have no clue. I, re I really don't. My daughter, Ava, um, asked that. And I said, well, I, I don't know, Ava, maybe, maybe I'll be a barista. And uh, <laughs> she said, Dad, you can't do that. You couldn't handle the pressure. <laughs> and, so she's probably right. So... Um, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I, I am telling you I'm seeking counsel. And in fact, one of the people that I respect a lot is Scott Rideout, former president of Converge. And I talked to him after he had a transition. And what he advised me is when you wrap up your season there, take a three-month sabbatical. Heal, seek God, 
find out what he's calling you to do and just refresh and rejuvenate and see what's up. We'll see what he has for you next. And I just want to tell you, that's exactly whenever this is done, exactly what I plan to do. I've already signed up with a group that specializes in kind of counseling pastors through a lot of different things. Um, Just to be honest with you, because the last few years have been extremely challenging and, and I'm feeling a little bit of burnout ca- catching up to me and I don't want the full burnout to set in. There's just a few traumas piled on each other and some other things that I need to work through and need a break. And I'm thankful that the board is giving that opportunity and when it's done to have that sabbatical and a season after to where I can figure out what to do with the rest of my life. So for now, I'm all systems go and currently locked in my assignment here. That's a lot, right? I know. And I just want to say this, as as a pastor and as a leader, I have to make an incredible amount of decisions, and many of them I know are not going to be popular or people are not going to like. But I have to tell you, this is one of the easiest decisions I ever made because I didn't make it. And yet, I have decision to make as well. My decision is how do I respond to what I believe God is doing through the people entrusted with these decisions? How do I respond in my emotions? How do I respond in my actions? And I can tell you the emotional piece of this has been really hard. I've been going through the stages of grief, and you know they don't, they're not just linear like you check them off. They come back and overlap each other, so I've been going through all of that. In terms of actions, I have resolved to trust God and stay focused on the assignment he has for me right now, which is right here. In the same way, you may not like this decision. You might have done it another way. But you also have a decision to make, even though it's like, hey, I didn't decide this. You do have a decision, like me, on how you respond to what God is doing. Like me, you're going to have some emotions to process, especially if you've been here for quite a while. But you don't have to let emotions drive your decisions. That's kind of what I've been experiencing. And here's the thing, at a time like this, it's easy to peace out. Like, all right, you're out of here. If you're not sticking around, why should I stick around? But here's what I want to say to you. First, I want to remind you, it's not because this decision isn't because I don't care. Because I, it's because what I believe God is doing in my life and in the life of this church. But more importantly, one of our core values at this church has always been, Jesus is our hero. It's never been, Bill is our hero. So Jesus has this. I firmly believe that. And listen, I understand the FUD. Remember FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt. It creeps in in difficult times, and it comes in when change happens. But remember, no great transformative work in your life or in the life of history happens without the difficult process of change. Now, I had no clue when our staff landed at the end of last year on the theme of transform how deep that was actually going to go, right? That God, God's funny like that sometimes. But I am eager to see what God is doing. And instead of reacting in fear or emotion... Um, I'm going to ask you what I ask the staff and elders when I talk to them to do in terms of response. Is join me for one more adventure. To go Guardians on the Galaxy, one more ride, right? Let's see what God is doing. And here's what I know what some of you are thinking, but Bill, there has been so much change in this church over the past couple of years. And I know that. And in my mind, This is one change that will clear the way to adding greater stability for the long term. Because the way that we've been doing things simply isn't sustainable. And I think a lot of you know that. And that's why you've been asking questions and so forth. And I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, I don't see that you read too many chapters in a row and it just says, things were good. Everything was fine. No changes. Nothing new to report. Right? Every chapter you read, it's like, oh gosh, something's going on. This person killed this person, stole this from this person. This one's mad at this one. It's like, right, there's always change. There's always upheaval. It's just the way that it is. And speaking of the Bible, remember when God wanted to lead Israel 
into the promised land. We, uh, Moses sent out um, the 12 spies. Um, two came back and said, this is good. Let's go forward. We got this. And then 10 came back. Like, There's giants in the land. They're scary. They're big. And they freaked out the rest of the community. And so what happened? Because they caused that panic. They missed their moment. And it cost them 40 years of confusion and wandering around. Let's not be like those spies that cost the community so much. Here's what I know. God's plans and purposes will always prevail. But through obedience and surrender, we can avoid a lot of the delays, the detours, and divisions that make the journey so much harder than it really needs to be. So let's work together. Now you may say, what do you mean together? You're not going to be here. Well, that's not entirely true. I won't be In a little while, whenever that is, I won't be the lead pastor anymore, but I am going to stay on the board of governance for a season just to kind of help with smooth that and be a consistent person in that place. Then after my sabbatical, because I, right now there's so much to think and so much to process and so much to do, after my sabbatical we will reconvene as a board and begin transitioning that and see what that looks like and you know, kind of go through all of that stuff. We'll work on that. But in the meantime, um, uh, you know, again, I am just going to continue serving this church. I won't be the lead pastor anymore. However, I will always be the biggest fan and I will always be the biggest cheerleader. You better believe that I'll be showing up for key things like when we move into our building, when we have key, all these kind of things, I am always for you. So let's cross into this next season, into whatever God has for us. Here's what I'm asking, because you're all going to have to walk away and process these things. And so here's what I'm asking, four things. First of all, pause. I understand what I'm saying is difficult for many, but like, breathe. Try to see what God is doing. I understand that I've had a lot more time to process this than you, so I certainly want to be sensitive to that. Um, But remember this, you can take that time now. Nothing's changing right away, so we can walk through this together. Um, Just pause. Process. Think through how you're feeling and why you're feeling that way. Now, if you're new, especially if you're the first time, you probably, you know, that's fine, who cares? I'm one of the next guys, right? However... And if, you're, if you've been around a while and I annoy you, you might be like secretly happy. It's okay. I still love you. It's, it's, that's real. You should see some emails I get. However, I still love you though. Um, but for many of you, for many of you, we've journeyed a lot of miles together. I've officiated many of your weddings. I've officiated funerals of many of your family members. I've dedicated your children. Baptized you. Counseled you. Taught you. So we got a lot of miles together. And I know that that brings connection between us. And I feel that too. And I I, I love you. I love this church, like 100%. And so, you know, like we birth this out of a call and we understand the great mission and it's always been a great privilege. So just process whatever it is. And what I encourage you to do is process your emotion instead of, reacting and talk about it talk to god and say god what is this that you're doing also talk to us you listen talk to me talk to the elders um talk to the staff and and, and listen i'm going to be around to talk to you if you have questions or comments or whatever it is um but just don't don't, don't freak out i'm not here next week um just, just like oh he rug pulled us he's out of here Let, listen um I'm not here next week because Saturday is my wife's birthday and Sunday is Mother's Day and I don't want to wake up dead. So I'm not, I'm, um, but you, you are going to be in great hands because Crystal is going to do an amazing message and it's going to be an awesome weekend. So the next thing I want you to do is pray. Pray not only about what you are going through, but pray about what we are going through and pray for God's help in all of this. Listen, do you want to be a part of the church? I get it. It's scary because, but I don't get to be a process, a part of the process in picking out a new lead pastor. Oh, yes, you do. You get to pray. And there is power in prayer. You get to pray for discernment and that whoever the person is, that they would hear the call on their lives. You get to pray for us that are interviewing and processing and deciding and trying to hear God's spirit. Pray and just trust that God 
is in control. God is always sovereign, even now. He always is. So, by the way, while you're at it, say a prayer for me. Say a prayer for the staff. Say a prayer through the elders. Everyone trying to navigate through this. Pray for the members. Pray for the people at this church. And lastly, proceed. Move forward. Don't just peace out. Why do that? Why not stick around with me and with us and see what God has ahead? Um, pause, process, pray, and proceed. Here's what I asked the staff, and here's what I asked the elders. I said, listen, let's see who God brings, and then give it six to 12 months to see what God is doing. At that point, if you want to talk, whatever. But God is up to something, and I believe it's going to be good. It's my belief that the best days of this church sincerely are ahead of us, not behind us. And, and listen, we... we you have family here. You have friends here. And this is what families do. They go through hard times together and they come out closer and stronger. So let's do that because our mission and our vision still stands. What's our vision? Jesus changes everything. So you're not kidding. It changes everything around here. But listen, he changes people's lives. Every week at our staff meetings, we sit and we talk about how God is doing this and this person, and this person's changed and transformed, and how so many people are coming to Jesus, and it's so encouraging. But we want to keep helping people making turns in Jesus' direction. You see, this area that we live in is filled with so many people who are lost and desperately need Jesus. And for 18 years, we've been a great beacon of hope in the greater Hartford community um, for God pointing people to Jesus. God has given us great favor. So let's keep that going. Now, when Moses was done with his time and tenure of leadership, it was Joshua who got to lead the people into the promised land. Now, it's my prayer. I don't get to be the one to do it. Uh, worked hard, but I don't get to be the one to do it. But it's my prayer is that the next leader is going to be the one leading us into our building and a space of our own. By the way, still working hard on that. We're talking to some, we have a prospect still going right now, so that's still coming. For those of you that thought that was the announcement today, I'm really sorry. I tried not to overhype it because you're like, that double stinks for you. But understand, we're still working on it, and um, we, we, we're, we're doing that. So listen, when we talk about this, I just want to rem remind us. Let's go back to what we said. Let's remember what God has done so far. All the favor, all the blessings, all the Red Seas he's parted on our behalf, all that he's done in us, all that he's done through us over the years. God has done great things. He has just worked mightily in this church. So let's consider those things. Let's remember those things. Let the, let's let those things inspire us and believe that he hasn't brought us this far to give up on us now. But let's not dwell on the past. Let's not fixate on what was. Let's not fixate on the things that are behind because the truth is, is those days that we remember fondly at the time were days when God was doing a new thing in that season. Just like he's doing a new thing now. He's not done with this. And so finally, remember, try to see what God is doing now. God says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God is doing a new thing and he's making a way. I know this next season isn't going to be easy. Change never is. But I believe if we lean in and try to see what God is doing, the new thing will be a good thing. And eventually, we'll probably all see it's even better than the old thing. Let's pray. God, we're thankful that we can turn to you in all things. And even as we process a season of change, we can, we can talk to you right now. I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that you would just um, give a sense of peace, that you are in control. I pray that you help us all to see what it is you're doing in this next season. I pray that you'd help us to be faithful, help us to be strong. I know this, the enemy moves in at times like this. He tries to instill fear. He tries to exploit uncertainty. He tries to 
pump up the doubt and he tries to divide. He tries to divide and conquer. God, I pray your protection. Don't let that happen to this body. Let us come out of this stronger. We believe that you are doing a good thing. Let us not get discouraged. Let us not give up. I pray you give me the strength to finish going and finish strong and finish well. And I pray that the new person would be identified and that they would be amazing and that they would be able to lead this church to places that I simply haven't been able to do. And I just pray for this body, God, that you would encourage, bless, guide, and um, help us just to navigate this season. God, we believe you're doing a new thing. Help us to perceive. Help us to see. Help us to trust you. In Jesus' name.